Prairie Yard and Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA. Mark and Margaret Yako Jolene, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHill.org. When our son was in high school, we went to see the play Little Shop of Horrors. He loved the man eating plant and just had to have a Venus flytrap after that. Well, it didn't live too long because we did not know how to properly care for it. The same holds true for other unusual plants like bromeliads and orchids. I'm host Mary Holm of Prairie Yard and Garden, and let's go learn about the proper care of the Bach plants, bromeliads, orchids, and carnivorous plants. have long cold and white winters here in the upper Midwest. One of the things that helps get through the long dark months is to have plants in the house. For me they are a reminder that yes spring and green grass will eventually return. And sometimes we get a special surprise when we get an unusual plant especially if it is a blooming plant like a bromeliad or an orchid. On rare occasions you will even find a Venus flytrap for sale. But how do we care for these unusual plants? Let's visit with Ricky Garza, who specializes in the care of these plants. Welcome, Ricky. Hi, Mary. Welcome to the Arboretum. Now, my first question is, is there more than one kind of bromeliad? Yeah, actually, there's about 2,700 different kinds of bromeliads. They grow throughout the tropical Americas and um, from like Florida down to South America. Um, they come in all different forms and textures and colors and the one that we're probably most familiar with is probably the pineapple. Um, this is a variegated pineapple here. Um, typically some people start you know they, with their bromeliad collection by have, potting up the top of their pineapple and growing it on and they really do grow pretty easy as long as you give them good light and stuff. My next question is, how do we care for them? How do we water them and what kind of light do they want? Well, there's a, being that it's such a large group of plants, they really can vary a little bit in their need for different requirements. One of the most important things about bromeliads is water. They're, they love water. They need to have a really good drained uh, media that they're potted in, but they love water. They like, like to be watered a lot. They, they have these little vases in the middle of the plants and, and those should typically be filled with water, flushed out. And In nature, um, little bugs and frogs and all different kinds of things actually take up residence inside these little pools or reservoirs of water. Can you use regular tap water or what kind of water should you use? Because they grow up, they're epiphytes and they grow up in the trees, they really are never in contact with mineral soil. So they basically they use the tree as a host so that they're up off of the forest floor and they're closer to the sunlight so that they can photosynthesize and grow and all that. So one of the most important things about growing them with, as far as the water goes is that the water is fairly mineral free. It's got to be nice clean water like rainwater or distilled water or something like that. Should you also water them at their soil level or just in the vase area? The, the vases should always have water in them. 
The media that they're growing in should be watered. Um, it's a good draining media, so it should be watered a couple times a week. They, like I said, they love moisture, but it's really important because they grow up in the trees that they have really good drainage. So you probably should not use regular potting soil for these because they would need better drainage than that. Right. I use a combination of orchid bark and charcoal and perlite, and that gives the plants a good substance to, to grow roots in, has some moisture holding capacity, plus it drains really good, which is probably the most important thing. So and because it's in such a good draining me media, um, you can probably get away with watering it more often. Like I said, the, the water, the faces should be full of water. In the home, you might want to have grow it like on a tray or something like that so that you can even overflow the water a little bit. And, and the tray underneath it will hold water and provide more humidity for the plants, which is part of the, what they need. They need really good air circulation and really good moisture. How long should you leave the water in the vase before you change it? Like, should you do that every week? or more than that because it gets kind of grungy in there. It does and it can get kind of stinky too. And in a, um, uh, The best thing to do really is to overflow the vase of water at least once a week so that you're sort of flushing all the, the stuff out of it and starting with fresh clean water. Okay, by, by overflow you say like set this into a sink and then pour water into it until the water and the gunk comes out and then add fresh? Exactly, exactly. Okay. How often should you fertilize? And do you need to fertilize? Fertilize, um, they're, they're low in sort of requirements as far as their need for fertilizer. Usually you can use like a regular houseplant fertilizer, but you'd probably want to dilute it by half or a quarter and fertilize as often as the label suggests, probably every other week. And that you'd probably want to do more during the growth period, which is in the summer months. And if you get good growth and foliage on the plants, then you're more likely to get a, a bloom from the plant as well when it comes that time. How do you get them to bloom? Is that a reflection of day length or what, what causes the plants to bloom? Um, the plants uh, usually have a season that they bloom in and it, it probably is generated by the day length. Their flowers can last for a really long time, so if you're lucky enough to bring it into bloom, um, the floral brackets, which are these parts, can last for several months. And then the, the little individual flowers come out of there. And the flowers themselves don't last that long, maybe a couple few days. But the whole brack itself stays showy for many months. What are some of these beautiful plants? What are some of these species that you have here? We have uh, Ananas. This is a variegated um, pineapple. Uh, Acmea is one of the most common house plants as far as bromeliads go. And I really should say that bromeliads make excellent house plants. You know, you, you look at these plants and you think they look tropical and, and maybe hard to care for, and they're really not. They're really very easy to care for, and they make great house plants. Plants that have thicker, more coarse leaves like this, they're going to need higher light levels. Um, that's why they, they have a, a more tough sort of texture than plants that have sort of a thinner leaf and plants that have darker leaves. Those are probably going to grow more in a little shadier position. So, so what, the ones that have a thicker leaf like this, do you think a south window, south exposure? Absolutely. They need more sunlight, more hours of sunlight. Okay. And then somebody with a thinner leaf or a colored leaf like these beauties here, maybe a east exposure? That sounds about right. And like I said, and if you're using them in a home, they could color up a, a dark corner for many months. Do they die after they're done flowering? The individual plants do. Um, that's a weird characteristic of these plants, but after they're done blooming, the plant dies. It may live one, two, or three years after they, they bloom, but, but they eventually die. But the good thing is that before they die, they always have little pups or, or little offshoots. So basically small versions of the same plant that they'll put out. And um, when those little pups or offshoots get to be about one third the size of the parent plant, you can cut them off and pot them up individually and you've got another plant. So even though the plant dies, it may leave you behind two, three or more 
pups are offshoots, so you're actually, your collection will increase as the years go by. So if you cut those off and you set them into your well-draining soil, do you have to brace them up because they don't, do they have roots at all at that point in time? Bromeliads usually have pretty minimal roots. Um, basically, it's just to hold on to the, the tree or whatever structure that they're growing on. But when you put them in a pot with, with good draining soil media, um, they do tend to make a better root system. So you do want to pack the bark and stuff pretty tight when you first put them in there. You know, don't worry about hurting the roots, but you want to pack them pretty tight to stabilize it. This has been great. Can we move on to orchids and can you tell us about those? Absolutely. This is a beautiful collection of orchids. As you can see, there's, there's quite an array of different sizes and shapes and colors of orchids. There's about 32,000 different kinds of orchids that grow in the wild. And they grow worldwide, all across the globe, from tropical areas to Minnesota and beyond. Besides that, there's probably about 100,000 different kinds of hybrids and cultivars. So there's a lot to choose from. <laughs> For Easter and Mother's Day, I love getting an orchid corsage. Are, are they in that same family? Well, the corsage orchids are usually more like the Cattleya type. They, again, they come in all different kinds of much bigger and showier flowers than that. And Phalaenopsis is probably the one that we're most familiar with as far as what you can get in the local store and stuff like that. I smell something really good. Is that an orchid that is, is giving off that beautiful scent? Yeah, it's the Oncidium right in front of you. It, uh, some orchids have no perfume at all. They rely on their color to attract their pollinators, but some orchids just have really heavenly scents. Now, say for example I get this as a gift. How do I keep it alive? How do I care for it? You're going to have to have a media that's made up of orchid bark and perlite and charcoal. So it's free draining. They need a lot of um, water, especially during the growing season. Well, I guess one of the key things about growing orchids is, and not being successful in growing orchids, is going to be that you get good growth during the summer months when the plants are actively growing. So you want to make sure they got all the light and water, humidity, and fertilizer that they need during the summer months so that when they go into their rest period during the colder, darker months of winter, that they have enough energy to produce their blooms. Okay, when you're talking about a rest period, do they go into a dormancy then? Most, uh, well, orchids grow mostly, the ones that we keep as, as house plants grow in tropical areas, so they don't really experience a winter like the orchids here in Minnesota would experience, but what their conditions or what they're dealing with is either a wet season or a dry season. Again, during the summer months, water copiously fertilize, and then during the winter, you're going to want to hold back and let them dry off a little more at the root so that because they do, they, they slow down their growth. You're probably not going to want to give them any fertilizer or very little fertilizer during the winter months, just enough to, to keep them you know, going, but not, you're not trying to promote active growth. So for light, maybe a south window, south exposure again in the summertime? Yeah, they need good light. Um, if you can summer them outdoors, even better, because then you're getting all the fresh air and the moisture and the rainwater. The, again, just like bromeliads, they're, they're very specific about the kind of water they get. They don't, because they grow up in the trees, they don't want any mineral-laden water. Or our, our tap water is often treated with chemicals that can injure the roots of, of orchid plants. So. You really want to go with a pure, distilled, reverse osmosis or some kind of, something like that kind of water. If you put them outside, where should you put them? Do you want to put them in full sun, or is that too much for them? Yeah, if you were to put these outside from being indoors all winter, they'd probably scorch. And they don't recover from that very quickly. So you want to prevent that by um, putting them either like on a sunny porch or if you're having them outside, a good thing to use is if you've got large, mature trees in the area. They kind of provide that dappled, light, shade, play kind of thing that orchids really thrive in. Some are, are more, you know, again, if they have sturdier leaves like this vanda here, they really 
are light lovers, so they can handle a higher intensity of light, where the Phalaenopsis with softer, darker leaves, they're going to be at the lower end of the spectrum. That's probably why they do, they're so popular as house plants, because the house, in the house, light levels are always a little lower. If you fertilize, should you use something like a bloom booster or just a regular house plant fertilizer? Me, I kind of alternate. Um, when the plant's growing, I use more of a, one that's higher in nitrogen and then more of a bloom booster when the plants are getting ready to bloom just to encourage better blooms. Is there anything, that's what I was going to ask next, how do you get them to rebloom? Is it hard? Yeah, again, it's just making sure that they have good growth during the summer months, you know, whether you're growing them outside um, or inside, just make sure that you give them plenty of good light, good air circulation, fertilizers that they put on a lot of growth and that's going to encourage better blooms come, come. most of them actually bloom during the winter months so um, like December through March you know there's all kinds of orchids blooming and, and not so much this time of year. You always get rogue blooms, that plants that bloom out of season, you'll find that even in the garden but um, typically most of them tend to bloom over the winter months. Well, this has been great. Now, my last one, and this is going to be the one that my son is going to be real interested in watching, too. Um, I want to visit with you about carnivorous plants. Oh, fun. I have a question. I'd like to grow some evergreens, but I don't want something that will get too large. What varieties do you recommend? Okay, well, you know, most people plant the spreading junipers, yews, or some of the smaller arborvitaes, but there's many other uh, great landscape evergreens that grow very well in Minnesota. Right next to me here is a bird's nest spruce. This is a dwarf form of Norway spruce. It's just as hardy as the large Norway spruce that gets to be a huge tree is planted in windbreaks, but it stays very small. It only grows two or three inches a year and just keeps this nice rounded shape. Uh, dark green color, doesn't winter burn. It's just a really nice, uh, perfectly hardy, sp uh, small plant that require virtually no pruning in the home landscape. We're here at the Dwarf Conifer Collection at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, and in addition to the bird's nest spruce, we have dwarf forms of white pine and red pine, even some of the spruces and firs, and there's a, these are all in a group of grafted conifers. Uh, somebody found an initial plant in a nursery or a forest and realized that it was a, just a natural dwarf and took small twigs off that original plant and grafted them onto a normal rootstock of the same species. And it's a little more expensive because they take longer to grow and you have to graft, do the grafting. But the result is you end up with these nice small plants that are really well suited for areas near your home or in a townhouse or in a, in a small lot, something like that. You get all the hardiness and beauty of a full-size evergreen, but with a naturally compact form. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. Well, Mary, these are all carnivorous plants. There's about 700 different species of carnivorous plants that, again, they grow throughout the world. The U.S. is actually a hot spot for carnivorous plants. We have a great variety of, of carnivorous plants here in the United States. We've got trumpet plants, we've got cobra lilies, we've got all kinds of sundews and butterworts and bladderworts. So, although they, they occur in a lot of tropical areas, and you would think of these as being sort of tropical plants, they're really not. They're, they're, a lot of them, are, like I said, are, are native here to the USA. When you use the term carnivorous plants, what does that mean? To be a carnivorous plant, they gotta basically they've got to attract, catch, and digest prey. By prey, you mean what kind of prey? For the most part, insects. I mean, most of the plants are pretty small, so we are talking about flies and pill bugs and things like that. Is there a Venus flytrap along in with these in your collection? Yeah, the Venus flytrap is probably the most iconic um, of all the carnivorous plants. We all know and love the Venus flytrap. Uh, interesting thing about the Venus flytrap is that it, its worldwide distribution is just a hundred mile range between North and South Carolina. So it really doesn't grow anywhere else in the world except for the Carolinas here in the U.S. All right, here's my question. 
How do you care for a carnivorous plant? The most important thing about caring for carnivorous plants is going to be the water. Um, though, like with the orchids and bromeliads, they grow up in the trees and they don't want any minerals in the soil. These grow in the ground in bogs, so they really need to be permanently wet. But they're also from a mineral-free um, sites. So peat bogs and things like that where they grow are basically devoid of minerals that come in from groundwater. The most important thing about growing them besides having clean water is going to be what you're potting them in. So you need to use peat moss or sphagnum or something like that, maybe a little perlite or something mixed in with that for a little good drainage. But it's got to be very mineral free basically. Okay, so don't use potting soil for these, but you can Absolutely maybe use not peat moss, and then mix in some perlite or vermiculite for really good drainage. And sphagnum is another good choice. Oh, okay. The best thing to do really is to put them outside during the summer months because they get good growth, they, they, they have good air circulation, and there's bugs outside that they can catch. I mean, if you look at these plants, they're just covered with little tiny gnats and things that they've caught themselves. Um, the Venus fly traps, you can see most of the traps are closed because they're able to catch flies outside. Um, I've got some trumpet pitchers here. If you were to take a leaf and slice it open, you would see that this whole tube is chock full of flies and things like that. Just, it's kind of gross actually. And towards the end of the summer, they can be so full of bugs that the, the weight of the insects will take these things down to the ground. But they're very good at what they do if you just give them a chance. If you're growing them indoors, if you really don't have a place to grow them outdoors, you might want to catch a fly every now and then to feed to them. Or sometimes even pet shops have a nice array of insects that they feed to pets, you know, whether it's mealworms or fruit flies or something like that. So when they catch the insects like that, and it looks like they're caught on the hair of the plants like this, do they actually digest those? They actually do release digestive fluids. I mean, even petunias, petunias, your average petunia has got hairs all over it and it catches and and it so it catches bugs too. So is, is a petunia carnivorous? That that's a tough question to answer. So I mean all plants can absorb nutrients through the leaves, but they they but are considered carnivorous plants, they actually have fluids that digest the prey. So what they're looking for is nitrogen because they live in mineral free soil, they are lacking nitrogen and they need nitrogen to grow. So um, when they're catching an insect, basically what they're trying to pull out is the nitrogen from them and what's left after they're done feasting is the insect's exoskeleton. So once they've processed their food, you know, a fly trap will open back up and the wind will blow the, the insect's body away or, you know, it sloughs off in the wind. Does it hurt the plants to touch the pads? Yeah, it's not a good idea at all. Um, that's a big thing, especially with children, because they like to see that action. Mm -hmm. That's why most people have them. Um, but the traps can only close maybe two or three or four times in its life. So after it's been sprung that many times, the trap is going to turn black and die. So, and if you've been just teasing it with your finger, it obviously it won't have any food to help it to grow. And if you're, you're losing your leaves and you're not adding to the plant's, you know, need for food, then, yeah, the plant will succumb slowly. And it's just not a good thing. And as far as plants like these sundews go, they've got these sticky little glands all over that trap the insects. And again, if you're touching it, you're removing that, that dewy portion that helps it to catch insects. If you have these in the house, what kind of light conditions? Where should you put them? And then if you put them outside, where kind of light should you put them into out there? Yeah, they, they really are high light plants. They really like full sunlight. And if you grow the, like the pitcher plants in less than adequate sunlight, they tend to be floppier. They don't hold themselves up nice. and they don't color up as well. So you can see that a lot of these plants have beautiful red coloring in them. And you won't have that coloring if you don't grow them in full sun. How do you know if you have to repot them? Repotting isn't really something that has to be done too often. If they start to get so big that they're growing out of their pot, they're kind of spilling over the edge, and it looks like it's 
painful for the plant to be in there, then, then you would want to repot them. You're going to want to use plastic or glass or galvanized. Um, you don't want to use any clay pots with carnivorous plants. It's too porous because you're trying to hold the moisture in, unlike with, say, bromeliads and orchids, where you want the, the plant to dry off as quickly as possible. These plants, you want them to hold the moisture. So you really, you'd want to grow them in a tray of water, maybe an inch of water in the bottom of the tray so that they're constantly moist. Are there any carnivorous plants that are native to Minnesota? Yes, there are actually. Um, this is the northern pitcher plant here. Beautiful large specimen. <laughs> Pretty much throughout the northern half of the state, there, there's lots of bogs and out there and if you, um, go out hiking in a bog, you're going to have to deal with bugs and heat and all that, but, but you could easily stumble across one of these beauties. Really? So that is native to Minnesota? It's native to Minnesota. Wow. As well as this little round leaf sundew here, which is kind of hard to find, but right in there, this little guy, they only grow maybe an inch or two in diameter, little round leaves, um, but they're also native to Minnesota. That really looks like a miniature Venus flytrap. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a sundew, so it's a pad with lots of sticky things like this. Considering that, um, one of the most important things, again, with the, us being the hot spot, like all the Saracenia, all the whole family, they, they all live here in the United States. And, you know, with, with their, a lot of them living in the north climate, what's important is that they have a um, winter dormancy. So orchids and bromeliads may slow down their growth in the winter. These plants actually need to shut down. So I keep them at like 37, 38 degrees all winter and they actually stop growing. They lose their leaves and they sort of die down. They go into a very dormant state. And you know, so these would be buried under the snow. And then in the spring, pitcher plants will put up their flowers. This is what's left of the flower stalk. But it's kind of interesting. They put up their flowers early in the spring, and then after the, the flowers pollinate and the seed pod starts forming, that's when they put up their pitchers. So in that way, they're not eating their pollinators, which is kind of cool. <laughs> that, that is interesting. All of these demonstrations and plants that you have showed us have been so wonderful. Thank you so much for letting us come and learn all about these unusual plants. You're very welcome. Glad to share. Funding for Prairie Yard and Garden is provided in part by Heartland Motor Company, providing service for over 30 years in the heart of truck country. Heartland Motor Company, we have your best interest at heart. Farmers Mutual Telephone Company and Federated Telephone Cooperative, proud to be powering ASIRA. Mark and Margaret Yako Jolene, in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. Shalomhill.org.